Hey, welcome back to another episode of Robot Cantina. Now, over the past six months, we've been doing independent research on how to get an automobile to go as fast as possible with both a lawnmower engine and a cement mixer engine. Sounds crazy, and it is, but I feel these sort of projects are often ignored by mainstream content providers. So I say, why not do something different? Now, if you haven't already seen the previous episodes, then by all means, take the plunge and binge watch them all. From what I'm told in the comment section, you won't regret it. Anyway, in our quest to go faster, we're going to apply some modern technology to the cement mixer engine that we're currently using on our street legal go-kart. Let's take a look. Today we're going to try something different and we're going to do a technical video. More specifically, we're going to bench test the small engine fuel injection kit that we unboxed in the last video. Now if you recall in the last video, we took a quick look at the EFI kit for our 420cc engine. Now the kit is close to being complete and only requires a few additional electrical connections in order for it to operate, at least on the bench. Now there's definitely some mechanical fabrication that we'll need to do in order to get the system to fit the engine, but we'll cover that in a future episode. So this kit was $288 through an eBay seller. Now keep in mind, I have no affiliation with the seller. However, if you're interested in this type of kit, you can search eBay for Motorcycle EFI, and that should take you to the seller. Now this kit is not plug and play and does require fabrication both electrical and mechanical. Also, it seems that once the engine's up and running, some tuning will be required. Overall, this appears to be an interesting alternative to the carburetor and ignition mods we've done in the past, but of course, it's certainly more expensive. Now this is a system schematic that I drew to help explain how we're going to bench test the EFI kit. If you're not familiar with schematics or electrical diagrams, I reckon this picture can be intimidating. But not to worry, that's completely normal. Now all this stuff over here is pre-wired and we don't have to worry about any of that. Actually, the only thing we need to be concerned with are three wires in order to make the system work. And two of them are power and ground. So basically there's only one wire that needs all our attention. And if we do it right, this should be pretty easy. So this is what the system looks like on the bench. It's not too scary. I reckon before we start fiddling with the wires, we ought to install the software. Now the software is straightforward, and I have included a brief overview later in the video. But for now, let's assume everything's installed and working properly. So like I said, we only need to deal with three wires, and here they are. The red wire is of course 12 volts, the black wire is ground, and the blue wire is for the crank position sensor. The red and black wire are easy to sort out, so let's take care of that right now. Now I'm going to set the volts to exactly 12, although it really doesn't matter. As long as the volts are between 12 and 14, the system should be happy. Anyway, once the voltage is set, I'll turn off the power supply. So let's do the ground wire first. Since we're only bench testing the system, we can get away with using these alligator clip jumper wires. We'll use a more permanent solution down the road, but for now this will be fine. I'm sure it's obvious, but my benchtop power supply is basically the same as a battery, so we're going to jam the ground wire to the ground side of the power supply, or if you like, the ground side of the battery. The same goes for the red wire, except it goes to the positive side of the power supply, or the battery. Now we can plug in the USB cable. Now keep in mind I've already installed the software and the drivers for the cable and the EFI system. All right, I'll get the program started, and this is what you'd expect to see with the ignition key off or the power supply off. Now let's turn on the power supply. And right away we can see signs of life. This gauge here is the throttle position sensor, and it measures the percent of the throttle opening. Let's give it a try. So here we have the throttle body, and let's see what happens when I open the throttle. Now that's exactly what we expect to see. Now attached to the throttle body, there are three sensors that are housed in this module. The first sensor is the TPS sensor, or the throttle position sensor, and we just tested that, so. The module also has the IAT, which stands for intake air temperature, and the MAP, and that stands for manifold absolute pressure. Now this nomenclature that I'm using is standard in the automotive industry, so if nothing else, you learned a little bit about some of the parts on your car today. Now let's check out the IAT. Here's the gauge on the dashboard and it's reading 67 degrees Fahrenheit. Well according to my shop thermometer, it's 67 degrees, so that seems about right. And now let's take a look at the MAP sensor. On the dashboard, the MAP sensor is reading 99.1 kilopascals. So if you recall, the MAP sensor is an acronym for Manifold Absolute Pressure. Now on a non-turbocharged engine, basically it's measuring the vacuum the engine generates. This sensor is used to help determine how much air the engine is consuming. 
This EFI system is using a MAP sensor because it's low cost. Most modern cars have switched over to mass airflow type sensors. Anyway, the MAP sensor is fine for this application, and most tuners prefer it. Since the throttle body isn't attached to a running engine, it should be reading normal atmospheric pressure, so we can confirm this with a barometer. Of course, here in the States, we read pressure in inches of mercury, but we can convert it to kilopascals, and it works out to be 98, which is close enough. Well, so far so good. The next item on the list that's easy to confirm is the CLT, or coolant temperature sensor. Okay, well it's reading 67 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's the same as the IAT sensor, and that also matches our thermometer, so that's good. Now let's try this. Yep, it goes up, and once again that's close enough. So that's as far as we can go with the simple checks. Everything else is going to require that we deal with the blue wire or the crank position sensor wire. So this 420cc engine came from the factory with a magneto ignition system. So this type of ignition system will generate spark when the magnet on the flywheel passes under the magneto. This is a simple, low cost, but effective ignition system. But unfortunately we're going to have to get rid of it to set up the new system. The only thing we are going to keep is the magnet embedded in the flywheel, and we'll use that to trigger the new ignition system. Now the good news is, this EFI kit is capable of controlling the ignition system, and has a 12x12 ignition table, and we'll get into all that in a tuning video. Anyway, we'll dump the magneto, and in its place we'll use this Hall Effect sensor. Of course we'll eventually need to fabricate some sturdy brackets, but overall it should be a simple fit. Let's take another look at the schematic. So it looks like we're going to need to connect the blue wire on the ECU to the Hall Effect sensor that we're going to be using for the crank position sensor. Now this can get a little sloppy with the jumper wires, so I'm going to use this nifty connector that I got from OpenBuilds.com. This connector will work for today, but at some point I'll have to source a proper waterproof connector. The Open Build connector is awesome for playing around, but it would likely fail if it was left out in the elements. So here's a quick recap on the Hall Effect sensor. Now I picked this up on Amazon and I don't have a link. You would need to search Amazon or eBay for a 10 mm NPN Hall Effect sensor. This is an open collector type sensor, and sometimes the vendors refer to it as open collector or as NO or normally open. Normally open or open collector means that when the sensor is not triggered, the output has no value, and it's more or less floating. Now electrically speaking, this will cause problems with the logic the ECM is expecting. So the most common solution is to use a pull-up resistor to force the output to a logic high when the sensor is not triggered. This is completely normal and makes a lot of sense to electronic people, but the average Joe might be oblivious to this and may cause a lot of frustration. The pull-up resistor should be about 1 kilo ohm or 1000 ohms. Now one more word of caution, this EFI kit did not come with any instructions, and right now I'm sort of figuring this stuff out, and it's because I've done this stuff many times before. Now in a future video, we might discover something else, and now would be a great time to subscribe, so you don't miss any updates as we move forward with the build. So as you can see, I went ahead and installed the connector onto the sensor wire. Now this sensor is an industrial part, and uses a standard color code. The black wire is for the signal, the blue wire is for ground, and the brown wire is for power, or if you like, 12 volts. Now on the other side of the connector, the color code is completely different, and on this side we use a, um, let's just call a Jimbo color code. The red wire will go to 12 volts on our bench top. Normally it would go to the switch side of the ignition switch. The green wire, well, it should be black, but I don't have any black wire in stock, so we're going to be using green. Anyway, the green wire goes to ground. The blue wire is the signal wire, and that goes directly to the ECM. Now if you recall, this is the crankshaft position sensor wire. And we also spliced in a 1000 ohm resistor from the signal to the power, and this will help the ECM process the signal. Let's go ahead and take another look at the schematic. So here's the connector we're focused on. Now the blue wire goes from the connector directly to the ECM. The red wire goes to the battery. Actually I show it going to a switch and then to the battery. The green wire, which should be black, but I don't have any black wire. Well anyways, it goes to ground. And now once again, notice how the color code changes as it passes through the connector. And let's zoom in on the resistor. Okay, so across the power to the signal, we have a 1 kilo ohm resistor. Now I feel like I've simplified this to a point where any experimenter can follow, so let's move on. Alright, so the plan is to wave the magnet in front of the sensor, and we should see the tachometer on the dashboard move. The magnet is of course simulating the rotating flywheel, so I hope that makes sense. Okay, you guys ready? Let's do it. 
All right, so it looks like we're all set to go. Now, it may be hard to see, but as I wave the magnet in front of the sensor, we're actually getting some RPM on the tachometer, and that's exactly what we expect. So now that we know the ECM can see the signal from the crank position sensor, we need to verify the fuel pump and fuel injection operation. Well, sort of. You see, we can't actually test these parts because it would be a bad idea to run a pump or the injector dry, and it's probably a worse idea to test them with gasoline. So instead, we'll use LEDs as a substitute. For this test, I'm using some wired LEDs from my junk pile. Now these LEDs will immediately fry if we connect them to the expected 12 volts, so we need to use a current limiting resistor. Generally, a 560 ohm resistor should be adequate for this application. A little more or a little less is also fine. Keep in mind these LED lights are polarized, and what that means is they need to be connected in the right polarity. So positive to positive, ground to ground. Now if you get the polarity wrong, don't worry, nothing bad will happen. The LEDs just won't work. So the idea here is to wave the magnet in front of the sensor, and that should turn on the fuel pump. And then we should see the LED injector start to flash. Alright, well let's see what happens. And that's exactly what we wanted to see. Now let's do it in slow motion. Slow motion. So far the system's working exactly like it should. Let's take it to the next level and test the ignition system. Now this system uses a GY6 type CDI ignition module, and I'm not sure if this is a true GY6 module or a custom unit that just looks like one. It's hard to say. The vendor did show a GY6 ignition coil connected to this system on their eBay page, so that's what we're going to use. Now the green post on this coil needs to be connected directly to ground. So in order to provide a return path for the high voltage, we also need to connect a spark plug directly to ground. I guess it's worth mentioning that the ignition system generates high voltage, and generally it's not high enough to harm you. But it will sting, and I'm sure a lot of you folks have gotten hit before, and after a while you sort of get used to being zapped. Anyway, my point is, use reasonable caution when working with ignition systems, and be aware when it's safe to handle the components. Alright, well let's do the magnet trick again and see if we can get spark on the plug. Well that's pretty cool, and I didn't even get zapped. Now the one thing we haven't tested is the oxygen sensor, also known as the O2 sensor. And this is extremely hard to test. Any sort of results we would get would be inconclusive, so it's not really worth testing. Now we will find out soon enough when we install the EFI kit on the engine. So let's take a quick tour of the software that's supplied with this kit. Well, at first glance it sort of has a common look and feel to it, and I guess if you used Tuner Studio before, you'd feel right at home. It's got a 12 by 12 VE table. Now VE stands for volumetric efficiency, and this table is used to calculate the air-fuel mixture. So you might have noticed I called this a table, and that's exactly what it is. You see, this is actually a lookup table. I'll give you an example of how a lookup table works. Let's see. Okay, when the engine's at 3500 RPM, and the MAP sensor is reading 65 kilopascals, the VE number will be 88. Now this VE number is used to calculate how long the fuel injector will stay open when it's spraying gasoline into the intake manifold. Usually the injector will spray for a few milliseconds and then wait for the next command from the ECU. Now the ECU has a lot going on when it calculates the injector spray time. First it gets the VE number from the lookup table, then it modifies that number depending on the air temperature, the throttle position, and the coolant temperature. Once the fuel is injected into the engine and burned during the combustion cycle, the exhaust gases are analyzed by the oxygen sensor, and this will let the ECU know if the process was within the expected range. If not, then the ECU will correct the mixture on the next cycle. So the oxygen sensor is sort of a supervisor, and its job is to give feedback to the ECU. Well, that's an overly simplified explanation, and it still sounds complex, and that's why they use computers to do all this stuff. So one more thing, now every one of these cells in the VE table can be edited in order to fine tune the engine. The ignition table works the same way, but instead of calculating fuel, it calculates when the spark plug should fire. And once again, these cells can be edited for fine tuning. Now this is the ignition settings tab, and it allows the user to select different methods of triggering the ignition, and a bunch of other stuff. As you can see, almost every aspect of the system can be configured, and that's the fun of tuning. I guess for now I'm fairly impressed with everything I've seen so far, and I can't wait to start fooling with this stuff. So let's take a look at how to install the software. 
So this video wouldn't be complete without a quick guide on how to install the software on your PC. The eBay seller will email a link to the software package after the item is purchased. The files come zipped up and of course you'll need to unzip them. Now keep in mind I'm using a Windows 7 laptop for this project and I have no idea if this stuff will work on a Windows 10 machine. Anyway, I copied the unzipped files to a folder that I created on the C drive. It should be mentioned that this software is executable in its raw form. That means it doesn't actually install or get laced into the operating system, so there's no DLLs or whatever. The only item that needs to be installed is the drivers for the USB cable. You can find the drivers here, just click on this and it will install the drivers. After you install the USB cable, you'll need to go into the device manager and click on ports. At this point you can see what COM port the USB cable is at. Make a note of that because you'll need it later. Now you can go to the EFI 2.5 folder and click on EFI Tune. This window will pop up and you need to select My EFI. The program will then start up. However, by default, it's probably looking at the wrong COM port. So you'll need to click on Communications and then Settings. Okay, here you'll select the port where the USB cable is installed at. Now, as you recall, we discovered that settings in the Device Manager. Anyway, in my case, the cable's at COM7 and that's what I selected. At this point, you can turn on the ECU power if it isn't already on, and the ECU should be able to talk to the PC. I think it's probably a good idea to save the project onto the PC. And what that'll do, it'll transfer the copy of the MSQ settings from the ECM to your PC. You might want to save this as original settings or something like that. So that's it. That's all I got right now. In the next EFI video, we'll have more cool stuff to cover, and you won't want to miss any of it. So now is the time to click on subscribe, and if you found this video to be helpful or entertaining, please click on like. This will give me the feedback I need to determine what future videos I make. And thanks for watching, and until next time.